Okay, we're going through the fifth step of development of human life, which is the creational life, is what the Pleiadians call it. And we're on the fifth level of that, which is called the position of recognition, reminiscence of earlier lives, etc. So here they're talking about uh, you know, not only understanding that there is a previous life and so forth, but you would have cognition of them, that your force of spirit is strong enough now that you can actually move in time more or less and see them, feel them, and understand them well enough. You would be able then, for instance, when a new person is being born and coming into life, through the force of your spirit, you could get in touch with that newborn spirit that's just come in to the woman and find out who it was and even help that spirit when it's first born to understand itself in its own path of evolution. Wouldn't that be something? I mean, we're all born into life and we stumble around. Uh, we're, depending on what environment we're born into, we're taught all sorts of unusual beliefs and sort of things. And most of us wind up at being about 20 years old really confused about what is life and what we're supposed to do. Well, depending on the society you live in, you're, you know, you're channeled into some area. You'll be a businessman or you'll be a nurse or you'll be a housewife or a cowboy, whatever it is. And depending on what country you grow up in, you're taught that life is this or it's this or it's this. But most of us at some point in our life, our curiosity gets the best of us and we want to know other things. We've got other questions. And like myself, I'm sure many of you have worn out a passport or two traveling around the world looking for a few answers. I know myself, I've done China and, and uh, uh, I've gone through that in Kyoto, Japan. I've been through Egypt and studied that old technology just out of interest. And perhaps there's something in my earlier lives which have uh, you know, led me to those areas to look for things. I'm not sure. But it's pretty fascinating how we really uh, you know, go look for some connections. We try to find ourselves in the life and figure out what our purpose is, figure out why we're here. Many people really would like to understand just what they're supposed to be doing with themselves this life. Well, if we had someone at this level, at this uh, development of level around, they could probably, you know, help us find it. Even at our level of development, which for most of us is, uh, you know, far less than this, that we're learning through uh, mild self-hypnosis and so forth to try to get in touch with ourselves a little bit more. And many people are learning to meditate to get into themselves and find some of the answers. And they're paying more attention to dreams that come to us at night and looking for you know, logical reasons why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, the sixth level of creational life is called the King of Wisdom, an Ishwish. Now, in the tapes earlier, I was telling you that in the old Lyrian language, Ishwish meant King of Wisdom. And this is a person who is still in the physical world uh, but has almost total and complete knowledge. He is a king of the wisdom of life. And this is where that comes into play and where that word came from. In our tapes, we were talking about Ptah being an Ishwish, Simyasi's father who ran the great spacer. He was an Ishwish. So he's living through the many lifetimes, the several hundred or maybe even thousands of lifetimes at that level of physical development where he is really rounding out his total knowledge of life. It has total understanding of all of nature's and spirit's force, as well as the logic of creation. The seventh level of creational life is cognition of spiritual peace at the universal love and the creational harmony. This sounds interesting, doesn't it? Cognition of spiritual peace. In other words, this, this being has become so developed, has such total understanding and connection through his spirit to creation himself, that he's living in spiritual peace. He can no longer be moved to hate and anger and jealousy and these things. His knowledge is far too great. He's a person of great wisdom that lives with the thorough knowledge and understanding of what life is all about and has complete cognition and awareness of creation and his connection to it. Must be a very peaceful, content state to be in. Also of the universal love, of the great universal love force that creation has for all beings, no matter what they may be doing that day. This is an important lesson for all of us, and many of us are learning now that just because someone doesn't look the way we like or act the way we like, we can still stand back and see them as a spiritual person, as a spirit form, on their path. And you look at that person, and almost it's, it's almost humorous. And you, <laughs> you think, well, he's not doing anything that I would be doing. But you're not prejudiced. You pose no value judgments. You just see an individual as a spirit form on their path, 
doing what they think is right for them on their own path of discovery. You're not threatened by them. There's no feeling of competition. You just look at them as another spirit form and go, all right, I'm with you. Send them a little of your own life force. Send them a little telepathic nudge that you care about them, that you love them, and you don't want anything from them. Give everybody their space to be themselves. Because as you're seeing now, we're all on our own path. As we go through all these steps of life that we're talking about, development of life, millions of years are going by. And each one of us is on a different path, a different level of discovery and learning. We're all looking for information that we need so we can crunch it with all of our little mechanics, with our subconscious mind, make our little logic, and feed our spirit what it needs at that time. We're all still making mistakes and learning. So look at someone else, and when you see them, don't look at them like, oh, gee, he's fat, or she's not this, or she's too tall, or I don't like the way they talk, or oh, gee, he's an Arab, or she's black, or whatever. It's nonsense. That's strictly your, a material viewpoint. You're looking at someone with strictly material eyes and with a material mind. It's time we all started looking at each other using our spirit and seeing each other as spirits. All as beautiful, loving spirits on our own path, needing our own space. And we can help each other. You know, that's what it's really all about. When we quit, when we quit looking at each other as material objects that we need something from, or we're prejudiced about, or we're competing with, or we're angry with, or we disapprove, when we can get past that, when we can see each other as spiritual beings, all of us are in creation. We're all created to the same universal love of creation. When we can see that, then peace actually will come to earth, and we will all be living in a more peaceful state. And that's where creational harmony comes from, because I'm quite sure at the creational level, the creational source that's actually controlling and providing the life force itself to all living things in the, in the universe, it's unconditional. You don't have to pay a price every day for the life force that's within you. You know, we're beginning to be able to measure that there is a life force, some sort of energy source inside the body that makes all this matter uh, actually animates it, makes it work. You know, that spark of life that's within us. Well, you don't have to pay a fee for that. There's no tariff. It's unconditional. You are given that creational life force by creation itself to live your physical life. And nothing is asked in return. How unconditional can you get? Well, the sixth stage of development of human life is what's called the spiritual life. Okay? The first level of that is the acknowledgement and realization of the spiritual peace, the universal love, and the creational harmony. Well, acknowledgement of it. Realization of spiritual peace. What a blissful state to be in. You're becoming aware and probably living most of your physical life now in some sort of state of meditative creational bliss where you're not paying attention to the world any longer with physical senses. You probably need no sleep at all. You can probably live for several thousand years just by the force of your spirit. And for the most part, you spend most of your time so connected to creation through the force of your spirit that you view the world entirely that way. The second level of development of the spiritual life is living in pure spiritual forms. At this level, you have almost no need for the material senses. They're probably beginning to even shut down where you no longer need ears to hear, you can sense with your spirit. You don't need eyes to perceive things. The force of your spirit is so, probably so strong you can project it anywhere and see what you want. You don't need to smell. You're not going to hit anything. You're not going to walk around because you can probably float or project your essence, your spiritual force, to wherever you like. The third level of spiritual life is spiritual creations. At this point, you are probably so developed as a spiritual being that you are very involved probably helping lower life forms uh, come into life, get through life, providing perhaps uh, uh, maybe this is what spirit guides actually may turn out to be. These higher life forms, people on the last throes of physical life, which can actually provide life force, uh, not life force energy, but spiritual energy to lower beings to use to learn from. Perhaps it's broadcast at uh, subconscious levels and we pick up when we sleep and so forth. 
The fourth level of spiritual life is disembodiment of the spirit from organical matter. We are now at a point where the things that our spirit needs to evolve can no longer be obtained through material senses. There is no longer the necessity or the need for your material senses because they cannot gather things that are of any use to us. Things that we now need to continue our evolution will only be necessary, excuse me, will only be possible through the use of our thoughts, of our thinking, of our spirit. Our spiritual conscious and our spiritual subconscious are now taking over. We no longer need the body. If we no longer need the body, we no longer need the death cycle, which means we no longer need our senses. At this point, the death cycle will stop. And we move into the fifth level of spiritual life, which is the first spiritual existence. That means you move into a state of existence which will last for thousands of years, perhaps tens of thousands of years, where there is no longer a death cycle, where the body, you are still in a physical body, but it's fading, where you would be so less dense, so light in weight, that at some point an in someone could put their hand right through you. At first, you would still be able to be seen as a physical form, but your features would be getting you know, less distinct all the time. Your body then has so little density to it, you probably weigh a pound and then practically nothing. So, but there's no more need for the death cycle. That stops. The sixth level of spiritual life is the final spiritual existence. The final spiritual existence would be a point where your spiritual energy has existed then for tens of thousands of years, has ultimately come together in connection with other spiritual forces, other spirit forms, and created what is commonly called collective consciousness. At that point, that collective consciousness, or high level of life, which Billy calls the Patali level, or even the Arahat Athrasata level, which, by the way, is seven different uh, levels. Arahat Athrasata is a combination of seven spirit forms together at one time. That's a collective consciousness. Patali level is even higher. At that point, there is no awareness, and has not been for tens of thousands of years, there is no awareness of the material body or senses any longer. Such does not exist. You are almost out, of, totally out of the coarse matter being and now becoming a fine matter being. Okay? The seventh level of spiritual life is pass over into creation. There is a point at which the being then becomes so developed. We are moving, we've been moving towards perfection all of these billions of years, and now we are almost to it. We have got to the point where wisdom and knowledge is so great. We now have such knowledge of creation, we are beginning to participate in the actual workings of creation. Our then, our fine matter existence is at such a high level where the frequency of our thoughts is so high we are almost totally out of touch with any material existence. The things that we do then, I can hardly imagine, would certainly be at the level more of just the control of creation itself and nothing to do with day-to-day -day life cycles. The seventh step of development of human life is called creation's life. And this basically is just the twilight sleep. At this point, the human and spiritual consciousness has merged together with the creational force that created the universe to begin with, and then is taking part in the actual workings of the creation. And at the time that the creation pulls back together and goes into its twilight sleep, at that point, our consciousness, our spiritual self, then, is part of the next creation, which creates the next universe, which then goes on to create six more and eventually evolves into being an entire Ur-universe. So the function of ourselves, our individuals at this point, is to slowly evolve through all of our material existences, five levels of physical existence, working into the sixth level of light body existence, finally ending up with creation itself. All the way along, we're providing knowledge, wisdom, and strength to the creation in our own small way. Each one of us is participating and adding some little bit piece along with that. And ultimately, we wind up being part of creation's life. And this, in the old times, is where the concept of that we are all gods came from. And I hear that phrase returning today, 
It's in many of the really old teachings, and they talk about the self and the one being at one with the creation or the gods or whatever. Remember also, as we talked about gods on the Emmanuel tape, gods are actually another way of describing what an Ishwish is. An Ishwish, a king of wisdom, is a being who still exists in the physical, but has almost complete knowledge of nature and spiritual and creative logic and laws. That's what a god is. A god is a being, he's at the top level of physical existence, but beyond that there is more. So a god also is subject to the logic of creation, because creation was the original idea that started all of this and created the universe to begin with. But creation isn't something that I see that needs to be worshipped or even thought of as a religion or a belief or anything like that. It's not a philosophy of life. It is the logic of what really is. It's just a matter of fact. As we learn more and more about it, we'll find that creation, since it created the universe and all life forms and so forth, it wasn't a human being. It wasn't a life force. It was a thought. It was an idea taken from another universe, which is going to perpetuate on and on and on. So we slowly have to let go of the idea of worship and that anything is responsible for our day-to-day -day lives. We are given a life force to use by the natural universal love of creation. We have intelligence and ability and aptitudes based on our accumulative life wisdom that is ours to use. And it's up to us what we do with our current lifetime. You can say we're 100% responsible for our own life, but when you live in a society and an environment like the one on Earth right now, are we really? I mean, there is so much of life which is dictated to us. There is so much of life that is forced upon us, where you're going to live, how you're going to think, what you're going to react to, how you're going to dress. There are so many things in life that are pushed upon us that we really don't have too many choices. So we are at a point of development where it's very difficult for the individual, once he even decides to lead a more spiritual life, it's very difficult. For one thing, you can't live in a major area, a major city, and consciously think that you're going to have very much spiritual growth. Because one of the first things you find out when you start developing yourself more spiritually is that we're all tuned into each other. That there is some form of kind of we form of thoughts that move among all people. And when you start tying into that, you find out that it's very unhealthy to be around large centers, i.e., for instance, like Los Angeles. If you live in Los Angeles, uh, if you're listening to this tape and you live there or New York or some major metropolitan center, you know that once you leave there, you say you go on a vacation to Colorado or some sparse area in the mountains where it's beautiful and you're back in touch with nature and it's lovable and the people are nice and you're having a great time and you're with somebody you love and you know everything is just wonderful and you're so peaceful and happy. Well, that's the natural state. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's in that environment, in that state of mind, where you can actually start growing spiritually because you're living more as a spiritual person. But when you get back on that plane and vacation is over and you go back to your major metropolitan, smog-infested city full of hate, anger, prejudice, and everything else going on, you have to defend yourself against all of that. As soon as you get back, it's like, as soon as you get back, it's like, ah, oh, there's this big heavy weight comes crashing on you because... Not only do you have to react differently to people on a freeway than you do to a reindeer in a forest, but your spiritual self has to start defending itself once again from this heavy mass of concentrated energy that's being created by these millions of people that are unhappy in this major metropolitan area. So if you take spiritual growth you know, seriously, you can read and study and so forth in a major metropolitan area, but if you really want to get serious about it, you're going to have to get out of town. You're going to have to move into an area where it's possible to live with nature, where you can actually live as a spiritual person, because the laws of the society of our country are certainly not in line with the laws or logic of creation, or even with nature. So in the city, you know, we burn up everything, we cover it with concrete. We're certainly not living with any respect with nature at all. So if you want to be a spiritual person and develop somewhat in those areas, you've got to get back out into nature and live with it. There will be a point someday we may elect a president based on wisdom instead of on power and economics and control. At that point, there will probably be a major change in our world. And hopefully the people of the United States, which are the leaders of the planet Earth, 
We provide the leadership and the inspiration. Perhaps the New Age metaphysical movement in this country will continue to grow and will fight for the truth and will you know, follow through and develop more and more as spiritual beings and they will develop and learn to do more and more things because it's the right thing and because it's the truth. They'll discover more about the truths. And ultimately, the spiritual beings of the planet eventually will overtake the material beings. And at that point, we will have a peaceful society, much like the Pleiadians do, and we'll have a better understanding of all of these steps of development of human life. Okay, we've just finished discussing the seven uh, steps of development of human life. And uh, by discussing those development steps, we are assuming, of course, that what we call reincarnation is real, which means that there are two different types of life. There's a physical life, and then there's the other side, sometimes called heaven, uh, and what the Pleiadians call a fine matter world. The spirit that is us, even though it manifests itself through uh, material lives, also is a never-dying, never-ending energy form gathers information from these lifetimes. So it, it is a fine matter existence. Okay. Now, what is the fine matter world like? Well, that's something that's really plagued man for a long period of time. What is it like after you die? What really happens? Where do you go? Or do you go anywhere at all? Well, among the Pleiadian information, here's what that's all about. They call it the other side, or the fine matter world. Commonly in our uh, society, we generally think of it as heaven, at least in the Christian community. So we're talking about the same thing here. We're talking about where it is you go when you die. To begin with, what exactly is death? There is, if you have, for instance, a car accident, and the doctor comes, and you're taken to the hospital, and they pronounce you dead, that means that the doctor is saying that your physical body is no longer functioning that you are your brain is dead there's no longer anything going on in the material body so they call that death well that is physical death uh, or clinical death medical death whatever you want to call it but it's not necessarily spiritual death spiritual death is at that point that the spirit actually leaves the body when there is spiritual death the, the spirit leaves the body it's called flesh like instantly it just zips right out of the body now that can sometimes be at the same time as physical death, but in some cases the body just isn't quite dead yet and the spirit hasn't really left. It's just not detectable by the instruments that our doctors use. But in most cases, usually when there is death, the spirit leaves quite uh, uh, very soon after that. In some cases it might be a few hours or maybe, maybe even a day or so in some particular cases where the body is still functioning but the doctor just can't quite detect it. But what happens then? Well, the spirit separates. And when the spirit leaves the body, once the spirit leaves the body, then the body couldn't possibly exist any longer because there's no spirit there to drive it. That means the life force that creation provides has left the body. Your spirit now drifts off into the fine matter world. Well, where is the fine matter world? Well, it's right here. You do not leave the planet. For one thing, whatever planet you're born on, you stay there during your material life unless you find some way off of it. But whatever planet you die on, if you die on the planet Earth, your spirit stays on the planet Earth. It's not possible for it to leave. This is part of creation itself. It's part of the logic of creation itself because your spirit is tied to the planet that it is living on. And that's for a number of reasons. One, what's called the Akashic Record. There are several energy reasons why that needs to be. It's not a choice that the individual has. When you die, you stay right here. The spirit really doesn't go anywhere. Spirits kind of congregate, you might say, in a layer of energy around the planet. They really don't go anywhere. They're just now existing in the fine matter world. Some people think of it as another dimension. But they are no longer concerned with the material they're no longer, because they're no longer in the material world. Actually, the fine matter world is kind of a state of cogitation, was the word that Billy used to try to describe it. He says it's similar to kind of like when you go to sleep at night. If you've been up all day and you've had a number of things on your mind and you're working hard, whatever, 
when you go to sleep at night, your conscious mind is shutting down, and your subconscious mind is in there just working away, trying to solve some of the problems of the day. And you know from your own experience, if you go to bed with a lot on your mind, sometimes it's very hard to sleep, isn't it? You find yourself sleeping very lightly because you're working out the problems of the day. Well, when you die and pass over into the fine matter world, one thing, the material body is now gone. There's no more senses, so you're not gathering any new information. So it's kind of a state of cogitation like sleep is. Your spiritual mind then, your spiritual self then, is kind of finishing up or cogitating all the things that has happened to it during its lifetime. It's similar to kind of like what a sleep state that's going on. One comment was, and they didn't clarify this too much, they said that there are several stages that the spirit will go through before it returns again to the material life. So it's suggesting that there could be some different levels of growth. Okay, There is awareness on the other side. The spirit, once it's on the other side, it is possible to contact it. It is possible to make some sort of communication, but it's not recommended or suggested. The Pleiadians say, for one thing, try to remember that once the spirit leaves this world and goes into the fine matter world, it's not learning anything new. It's not experiencing life at this point. It's in just kind of a sleep or a cogitating state. So it doesn't know any more than it did when it was here. And it has little or no memory probably of any actual experiences at that point. What it has is the wisdom that's taken forward. Because the spirit itself does not accumulate memory experiences. It accumulates wisdom from experience. That's what it takes with it. So if you wanted to contact a spirit on the other side, uh, although it is possible, don't expect to uh, find any profound em any information or anything because they don't know any more now than when they left. Interesting enough is uh, that it's really not very simple to contact the other side. Uh, for one reason, they don't really have any interest in the material uh, because at the moment you're not real interested in being on the other side, are you? You're not interested in getting in the fine matter world. You're trying to stay alive. Well, when you're in the fine matter world, apparently there's not really much interest in the material world either because you're not in material form. You've left your body behind. You're now a fine matter energy again. It was explained that in order to get in contact with the other side, though it is possible, but it's necessarily to know what are called keys or symbol language, that in order to communicate with them is very difficult, and that most of the times when mediums or psychics whatever believe that they are in contact with the other side, they really are not. Really what they're pick doing is picking up telepathically images and memories and so forth out of the individual's mind that they're talking to. For instance, if you were to go to a psychic and say, gee, I would like to get in touch with my great uncle Harry, can you do it? And the psychic says, well, let's try a seance and let's see if we can get in touch with uh, Uncle Harry. And she may believe that she is whatever, but she's not. Because what she's actually doing is in getting, she's telepathically picking, she's telepathically picking up information from you out of your mind about Uncle Harry. And then you're fascinated that suddenly that she knows what Harry, Uncle Harry looks like or what Uncle Harry says. And she may remark something that she'll say, oh, gee, that's just how, how Uncle Harry talked or that's what he always said. So you think that somehow that they're in touch with Uncle Harry when they're not. To begin with, Uncle Harry in the fine matter world probably doesn't give a hill of beans about being in contact with anybody. And if he actually felt something telepathic from a psychic, probably wouldn't even respond or do anything about it. The other comment was that occasionally people do make contact with spirits, even trying to trap them, I mean, get their voices on tape. And the Pleiadians remarked that quite often that a spirit, once it's on the other side, doesn't even want to be contacted. And if it is, usually, well, uh, regard it as kind of a nuisance and will give disinformation or treat it as a joke or will say something kind of silly anyway. So it's uh, not really recommended. The other view was the fact that since the spirit is in the fine matter world on purpose in order to sleep and cogitate and kind of, you know, uh, recuperate a little bit from the material life, that's not a good idea to even disturb the spirit. They don't. On a Pleiadian world, it's considered just not a good idea uh, to even disturb the spirits, and they don't do it. They just leave them alone. Well, this leads us into the next topic of kind of interest, which is reincarnation. By the way, the word reincarnation and incarnation are the same thing. They both come from Greek words, and they mean exactly the same. Now, let's say the spirit has been on the fine matter side of the world for a period of time, and it's time to come back. 
Well, how do we know, or how does the spirit know when it is time to come back? Well, there are a few determining factors that determine when a spirit can come back. To begin with, when you're in the fine matter world on the other side, there is no time. You are no longer in the coarse matter world, which is affected by the time impulses, the wave of energy that we call time that moves through. It only affects the coarse matter world. So when you are in the fine matter world, there is no feeling of time. There's no sensation of it. A spirit could stay on the fine matter side for thousands of years and really not be aware of it. It's not like they're awake standing on one foot or the other just waiting to get back into the material side. So you don't have to worry about being stuck over there. What uh, does happen, though, is this. Normally on a planet like Earth where we have such a high population, okay, when someone passes over into the fine matter world, normally the average turnaround time, the Pleiadians call it, before they will come back into the material life is on an average of 152 years. That means if you live a long and normal and healthy life to fulfill your lifespan, that you will come back in approximately 152 years. And then you would re-enter uh, the window of opportunity, they call it, and come back into life in someone else, generally within the family. Now, that time span uh, can be altered somewhat. And here's how it works. If you have a shortened life, maybe you die from an accident, young child, 10 years old, is in a car accident and dies, okay, they will come back faster. Okay, the longer you live and the more you learn, the more you contribute to your spiritual growth, the slower you come back. Okay? The shorter you live, the less you learn, the faster you come back. You have no say-so in this. It's, it's part of the mechanism of creation which tends to balance things out. So people who live a long period of time, if they live to be 90 or 100 years old and have had a really good life, they probably wouldn't live that long anyway unless they were basically well-balanced, happy people. So they're probably going to come back slower, 150, 170 years. If someone, however, you hear of a young child dying at, you know, at birth or a one-year-old, they may be back very quickly, generally not less uh, than 15 years normally. However, there's an exception to that rule. Apparently, uh, every 25,860 years when the Earth moves in closer in proximity to the central sun, which it is just now and has been since 1937, we call this the new age is the general jargon or term to call it. But there is a step up in frequency and electrical radiations, apparently, that influence several factors in our life. And rebirth is one of them. And there is a tendency, uh, I'm told, that for rebirth to be faster during this time period. So it's quite possible even that a young child, say, it should die at birth or perhaps from abortion or something, that they'd be back very quickly, possibly right away within a few days, weeks, or months, something like that. Okay. When it's time for a spirit to come back into the material world, uh, it's a natural process of creation. Uh, the spirit really doesn't uh, decide what time it's coming back. What happens is when it's ready to come back, and has something to do with like waking up in the morning when you're just ready to wake up, when it's ready to come back, creation will provide the mechanism by which it happens, and there's a natural tendency for that spirit to come back within family. The first priority, apparently, is usually level of evolution, that the spirit will try to come back into a woman, uh, equal in level of evolution, uh, will try to stay within family. Quite often, your great Aunt Harry may have been someone else's aunt, have been someone's uncle or something like that. You can change gender from lifetime to lifetime. Creation doesn't do that. People do it kind of subconsciously. Uh, how that works is this way, that there is uh, kind of a programming that's done subconsciously in the individual. If you are living a life as a male and uh, wish to come back as a male, it doesn't take any more than thinking that. You literally program your subconscious for wanting to be a male in the next lifetime, and it will be. It's not decided by the mother. It's decided by the spirit itself. If you are un, uh, apparently unresolved on the issue and really don't even think about it or care, however your subconscious will, it may kind of go either way. So you have some choice in that. There is some programming involved there. If you go through lifetime and are confused about your male role or your female role, which some people are, perhaps they go through life and they're having a terrible time with their love life and their sex life, 
emotionally, they're upset, and they just are totally out of balance, and they go and they die, and they are confused about themselves and about their sexuality and so forth. And then they will come back pretty much the same way. When they come into life, there is no programming. They come back in slightly confused, and depending upon environment, they may continue to be confused, and this is what leads to homosexuality. Homosexuality is not a third sex. Uh, it's not something we should be developing in our society and giving rights to it. It is a confusion of spirit in the fine matter world. And once we understand more about that, we can help people when they have confusion of spirit by helping them find out what they're doing, what they're thinking, and help these people find themselves, you know, uh, gender-wise. The Indians were always good at that. They would teach the young men to be more male and to understand their male hormones and their male attitudes and, you know, come with me, son, and do this and so forth. Now, I realize it's probably not quite as simple as that, but that's the general idea about what, what uh, confusion of spirit can cause. The, by the way, when there is a, um, a conceptual act by a male and a female, uh, within three weeks' time, right at about three weeks, is when the spirit makes the decision whether or not it's going to come into the mother. Okay? So it's within three weeks, although the mother's not aware of it. But that's when the spirit makes a decision whether or not to attach itself to the woman in this window of opportunity. The woman becomes pregnant and provides a window of opportunity for a spirit to come in. It will within the third week, and then it attaches itself to them. At that point, the spirit has decided that it will be born in this woman. So in a Pleiadian world, the morality of abortion then, the issue would be that uh, there can be no abortions after three weeks because the decision has been made that there is an individual then attempting to come into life at that point. On their world, however, they benefit from greater spiritual and creational knowledge, and many of their people have the ability then to telepathically communicate with the spirit coming in to see who it was, uh, any problems they may have, did their last life end in trauma? Are they bringing some confusion with them? Uh, what path are they on? Excuse me, are they needing some sort of um, you know, special knowledge? And they can actually sense the feelings and experience that are in these beings, read their past lives, and see what they need to learn when they're coming into the new one. In other words, they treat each newborn baby as a person that's on path of discovery, that's on a particular path of searching and knowledge, and they facilitate that. What a marvelous idea. Now, in our world, we look at children as possessions. You know, if we have a son or whatever, we say, ah, this is my boy. He's going to be a football player. He's going to be this or whatever. And we look at it like we created it. We possess this thing. We have made it. You know, this is my boy that I made, or this is my daughter, and so forth. Well, that's kind of a wrong viewpoint. We need to start looking at it as if these are people coming back into life on a path of their own. These are people coming back into a new life that need understanding, that need special attention to their personality, to their character. We're not supposed to mold them into our shape. They're on their own path of discovery and knowledge. They're working on their own evolution. They're not working on our evolution. They're not here to serve our needs, to bolster our ego or whatever. They are not a model of us. We get confused by that because quite commonly they look like us. See, the man and the woman provide much of the information that goes into actually creating the body. The spirit itself, when it comes along, provides certain information, generally in the, in, just in the face. If you could see pictures of yourself, say, for the previous lifetimes, you'd find that the right across the middle of the face, where the eyes and the nose and the ears in that area are very similar. That, that face, that look, and the eyes in there uh, so, seems to be, for some reason, the spirit itself dictates how that looks. But the rest of the body is, of course, dictated mostly by the, uh, you know, the factors from the mom and the dad. So when the baby comes in or the person comes in and makes the decision at the third week, it's in there then developing. Just a little aside here and dealing with the reincarnation, I, I know this is a subject that, you know, we, we don't have a really a lot of nuts and bolts scientific information about this yet. We are not developed yet enough in spirit that we really know very much about it. We're just kind of, you know, we're in the belief stages here. However, there has been some marvelous work by, done by some English uh, people in studies in India where there's been young children come in 
and at a very early age, when they're able to talk and so forth, still have vivid memory of a past life. And there's been a lot of studies on this. It's very fascinating. Where these young children, maybe say they're five years old, they'll be born, and they will describe a lifetime in the room that they were in, what their parents looked like, where they lived, uh, you know, everything about it. They'll have vivid memory of it which is amazing, and these investigators will go track it down, and they'll find that these kids somehow knew everything. They were exactly right. So somehow they came back, and quite commonly it was very fast. Generally, it was a very quick turnaround. So there is some, there is some you know, much better information than we have before leading to this uh, idea of reincarnation and reinforcing the idea that it actually does exist. As we become more and more developed in the use of our spirit, it will become more obvious to us individually that it is true because more and more you will have the ability to actually see your own past lives and the futures that you're creating for yourself, and you'll know yourself that it's real. A couple of things, uh, we're talking about birth here and so forth, and uh, there's a few ideas that the Pleiadians had about, uh, and Billy had asked some questions about that I thought were kind of interesting that I want to run over. When a spirit comes in to uh, a mother, there are several things that go on here. And one of the, some of these things have to do with the chromosomes, uh, the DNA, and genes that are intermixed going on here. Because we have a father contributing, we have a mother contributing, and then we have a spirit coming in. So there's three people all taking part here in the creation of this new material person, of this new persona, this new personality that's being formed. Because at this point, the spirit that's coming in is not a personality. Okay, it doesn't have a name. It doesn't think of itself as a name. It is an energy force that is moving into a new material life, helping to create a new material life, and it carries forward it, with it wisdom from previous lives, but it's not bringing necessarily memory, and it does not bring persona. A child is not born thinking that my name is Larry, this, that, and the other, although there is some strong indication that children like to name themselves. And then on a Pleiadian world, for instance, the mother will telepathically try to make communication with the child to see what it wants to be called, its first name. Because the first name of an individual in a Pleiadian world is, like we talked about earlier, indicates their knowledge and level of evolution and the wisdom. Something about the individual. Names have meaning. And uh, there are many people you may have run into that don't like their name and re you know, prefer to call themselves something else. Where a parent will go through a book, they get in a store, and they'll look through all the names, and they'll name their child something they think is really great. And, of course, the child had no say-so in the matter at all. And it might be a name that feels wrong, just doesn't apply to that person at all, and doesn't make any sense. How many people do you know that don't use their real given name? Uh, an awful lot of people use a name that's slightly different. For instance, even myself, my name is not uh, Randy Winters. I was born James Randolph Winters. Uh, Randolph was my middle name. I've never used James. I've never used Jim. I've never even heard anybody call me that, except for a brief period for a couple of months. When I, I tried it out once. I, I had moved, got a new job, new friends, and I told everybody my name was Jim. I was already about 25 years old, and I thought I'd try to see what it felt like. It felt so odd, so left-handed, I just didn't feel right at all being called Jim. And so I dropped it. I grew up always being called J.R. or Randy. And I never used the name James. And my family, for some reason, even though they named me James, they never called me James either. Even when I was a baby, I was little Randy and little J.R. Okay. Well, dealing with genes and uh, wisdom and intellect and so forth, there's a few comments here I thought you might find kind of interesting. One thing that the... Um, Billy asked you a question about chromosomes and so forth and how they affect people. And the Pleiadians mentioned that normally human beings have the same number of chromosome pairs within them. Chromosomes carry the information for character, for the form of the body and the sex of the individual. Now, the sex of the individual information, uh, information is going to be given to that uh, chromosome by the spirit when it comes in. The chromosomes are the essential carriers of the genes, uh, which influence the chromosomes and cause them normal or abnormal switching and so forth. Age is a gene-conditioned factor, they're saying here. And that the brain and the spirit then use the genes, in other words, to do certain things. They give information to the cells to regulate life for the regeneration and disintegration of the cells. 
Genes are not connected to intelligence because this is caused by spiritual evolution. Again, the spirit carries forward the wisdom from the lifetime, brings that forward and puts it into the, the individual when the body is being created in the mother. Spiritual thinking and wisdom and intelligence are factors of the spirit. These manifest themselves organically in the brain. What happens is once the spirit comes into the body at the third week, okay, it's about the eighth week that the brain starts being formed. Okay. When the brain is being formed, we have the mother and father who have contributed their, uh, you know, their genes, their, their factors. The spirit then comes into play, and here's why. What happens is, as the brain begins to form, it has to know how many connectors, neural connectors, dendrites, synaptic junctions, and so forth to make so that this individual can think. Well, some of that information comes from the spirit itself. The spirit starts sending information to the, uh, the newborn material body that's being formed on the number of connectors and so forth that are going to be needed to house the intelligence of the wisdom of this spirit. So once the neural connectors are all in place, we've got all these dendrites and so forth that are in place, then a very interesting thing starts to happen. The information then from the spirit that's carried forward from all these lifetimes it's fed into the body, into these connectors, and it flows into the acids that are in the brain. So the information, the fine matter information, is transferred from the fine matter world. A copy of it is more or less kind of downloaded into the coarse matter world, which is the acids in the brain. Because we already know the connectors in our brain, when you think, all these little neural connectors get excited and run through the dendrites and there's all these synaptic junctions that little electrical charge goes off and it affects the chemicals in the body and the chemicals in the body do this and then so forth and all the cells are affected and our body is in operation. Well, within those acids in there, that is where the wisdom from your previous life is stored in coarse matter form. Well, I see once again I'm running out of tape, so just fast forward this here. There's just a second or two left, and I'll see you on the other side. Okay, we're back. And when we ended up on the other side, we were discussing how wisdom from your spirit gets into your body when you're born. And we were just talking about how once your brain is being formed, it receives information from the spirit, telling it the number of connectors to create so it can be housed. And once all the connectors are made and so forth, the information from the wisdom from your spirit flows then into the acids in your brain, making a coarse matter copy then of the knowledge that's in your fine matter spirit. So you then have access uh, to the information from your previous lives in two different ways. Excuse me, you can access it then through your spirit in the fine matter self, or you can access it through the acids, which is what we do normally. So your material body then has been provided with a copy, so to speak, of all of your wisdom. This is where your intelligence comes from. Uh, actually, it's where you know, your, your aptitudes and your abilities would start stemming from because you have information to draw on. You notice how some people are going through life, some things are just very easy for them, or you find yourself sometimes already knowing things very easily. Uh, you may come across some philosophy or idea in life, and it just makes a lot of sense to you, and you already seem to know all about it, and you just kind of go, uh-huh, yeah, sure, uh-huh, it's real easy to you. Well, that's because that information or wisdom from an experience similar to that is already in there. It's already in the acids. You already have information, background, wisdom on that particular subject. If you get a feeling of deja vu sometime, like you've been someplace before or you've met someone they're very you know, familiar or whatever, it's quite possible they were. Or it's quite possible you've experienced something very similar to it before. So you have a certain amount of information you get. It's kind of like buying a computer and it comes with software already. It already has word processing and database and things already in it or you might get a computer with nothing in it. But uh, our brain seems to work pretty much the same way. It's unfortunate in our society that we don't know enough about spirit uh, power yet and spiritual knowledge and abilities, so we really don't train people in the use of their spirit. Well, it's a real good thing 
If we didn't do that, if the Spirit didn't put the information in the acids, and we didn't have a copy of all of our wisdom, my, my, we'd be in big trouble. So thank you very much, Creation, for at least allowing us to you know, have some sort of access on the material side. This leads us actually to an explanation of why we're all different as far as aptitudes, abilities, and intellect. As we're going through our material lives experiencing things, we're accumulating wisdom and knowledge, and it comes with us. Your advantage to using your spirit to access this is, one, it's probably of higher quality because the acids in your brain can become damaged. Uh, they can become altered because of poor pregnancy, uh, health problems, and so forth. Dietary disease and things can set in and affect the, you know, the brain, the connectors, and so forth, so that your material self does not function completely properly. But the spirit side of yourself cannot become ill. It cannot become illogical. It never goes to sleep, and it doesn't die. It always retains the wisdom. So at any given time, you can always access your spirit through meditation, or you can even do it in a conscious wake state once you get better at it. You can access using your spiritual self and find out information, not only about yourself, but you can use your spirit, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, to access other levels of information, other people, Akashic Records, ETs, higher life forms, etc. Another interesting thing this kind of leads to is the fact that if a copy of your wisdom is in the acids within your brain, then it's possible to transplant those acids. It's quite possible that we could, and scientists, some scientists are already working on this, you could take an individual that's very lowly evolved uh, or someone who we think is kind of mentally off of it or retarded or whatever. And in many cases, these people are just very young spirits that are born into our society with so few lifetimes that they have no accumulated wisdom. They're not idiots. We just call them that clinically because they seem to not be able to do anything. But quite frequently, these are just beings of low evolution. Well, you could put a acid transplant. You could take a person of high evolution and take some of the acids from them, transplant them into the other individual, and they'd perk right up. Gone would be the confusion, and their level of evolution would pick up greatly. This is one reason also, uh, because of the acids, why it's possible that a, a mother and father, perhaps of low intelligence or low evolution, it's possible for them to have a son who could be brilliant and vice versa. Really brilliant parents could have a son of low evolution. That's not the, tend the norm though. Generally it, it's more of a normal because the level of evolution is one of the main priorities of, uh, of when a spirit comes in and chooses a mother or comes into a window of opportunity. So normally you don't see that too often but it is possible. Uh, the genes then they're in that are influenced by the spirit and they pick up all these impulses and they store and they can, can create uh, confusion in a life form when you have a real mental illness. See, a real mental disease can quite commonly be caused uh, by a confusion of the spirit itself. You can't make a spirit uh, form sick and you can't make it illogical, but it can become confused in some areas where it has... Uh, wisdom and knowledge and so forth it's gained from experience and it could be at a point where it hasn't quite solved things it can be confused well in that particular case then the spirit is affecting the genes that are in that person the impulses then are picked up by the genes are stored and this person becomes confused in a lifetime so that's entirely possible actually another thing that's pretty fascinating that can happen is that on some occasions when a uh, person dies and the spirit leaves the body, if it's an accident or it is at a time when the subconscious of the individual is not expecting it, your subconscious knows when you're going to die. It already knows that. You can access that generally yourself through meditation if you want to find out. Well, your subconscious is always knowing what you're going to do even in a few days in advance. Uh, this is one of the techniques that the Pleiadians use to examine our subconscious and find out what we're really thinking. They can do that because even though you're thinking consciously, most people don't, uh, are not aware that they can access their subconscious or don't bother. But your subconscious knows what you're already planning on doing for the next few days. So uh, it's possible to actually access, access that in there. Well, when an individual passes over and is going into the fine matter world, quite often, if it's not a expected death or the individual just doesn't want to leave the material plane for whatever reason, 
that spirit can actually move into another living being where we have a person then who suddenly is uh, housing two spirits within itself. That not only is possible, it's not that uncommon. Apparently about 10% of the time that happens, and this can lead to what sometimes is considered as mental illness, where a person suddenly has dramatic personality changes or suddenly becomes very confused. I can tell you I'm quite aware that some very well-established clinical psychologists have stumbled across this accidentally, where people have come to them quite confused with apparent mental illness and they can't figure out what it is. And through hypnosis, they've been able to find out that there is another personality inside of this individual. And during hypnosis, the psychologist has been able to talk to that other individual, that other spirit which has moved into this person, and convince them that they have died, because they don't know where they are. You know, convince them that they have died, and it's okay for them to move on, to let go, and go on into the other side. That they are confusing the person that they are in, they are in a wrong body, that it is unnatural, and to move on, go on and fulfill yourself with your own evolution. They will, the person will come out of hypnosis, the spirit will leave instantly, because it has the ability, once it just gives up hanging on to the material, it slips off into the fine matter side, and the person almost instantly then is relieved of its confusion. There are documented cases of this, hundreds of them, by several clinical psychologists. So it's not just an oddball theory, it's actually really happening. Okay, we've been talking an awful lot here about our spiritual side and our material side. And we've been uh, talking and figuring out about how we go through life cycles. We go through seven steps of development of human life. So, and all of this is following the logic of the creation. All of these things that we go through, these cycles of life that we go through, are all embedded in us. The instructions, so to speak, and the matrix that controls all of this life cycling and evolution is already built into the creation itself. Because we are a bit part of the creation and we are just going through the cycles the way it was meant to be. So that's why we have seven stages of development, and that's why we are actually two beings. We are a spiritual being, which is going through a series of material lives. Those material lives, those personalities, that's you and I on the material side. We are Barbara, Nancy, Bob, Larry, whatever our particular personality is right now. But that's a material being. Just for a moment, I'd like for you to get the exhibit that I um, have in the little handbook. There's a drawing of a, a big circle, and it says the, uh, the, the uh, two-part being on there. There's, it says on the left side, the material side and the spiritual. And I'd like to explain to you a little bit, as it was explained to me, how the material being and the spiritual being actually interact and what's going on while we're in this material life. You see, even as you're listening, thinking, all the time that you're in your material life, you are also a spiritual being. And that spiritual being is in there all the time, listening, paying attention, and trying to gain in spiritual growth. That's the, uh, the, the whole impotence why you're trying to learn all the time. That's what drives you to find, find out things, to make a quest for information. The spirit needs food. And the food it needs, the way it eats, is experience. It's truth. It needs wisdom from your experiences. So you're always encouraged by your spirit to go try things, look into things, and search for answers. And that's where that comes from. Well, on my little drawing here that you're looking at, you see on the left side it says material side, and over on the right side it says spiritual side. Now what I've done here is I've just made a little drawing to show you the relationships between the material and the spiritual. It's just a little diagram to explain a few things. You'll notice on the left side, it says that there's a conscious part on the material side. Now, we know that. That's what we're using right now as we you know, sit there and listen to this tape. We have a conscious side, a conscious mind that we use all the time when we're awake. We also have a subconscious. Some people call it unconscious. Some people are unconscious. But we have a subconscious self. The subconscious uh, has its uh, little machinery that it does. It's kind of like the engine of ourself. It's where we do all of our, you know, our, our thought processing, our number crunching, and so forth. And then there's a thing that's called the psyche. The psyche over there is kind of your storehouse. That's where you keep all of your material 
memories, ideas, and conclusions and so forth. It's kind of like the hard drive on your computer. Okay. Uh, then there's a little thing there that says we form. We'll come back to that in a second. And in the middle it says filter. Well, there's a filter between your material side and your spiritual side. So even though your spirit is awake all the time, it's listening to everything that your material side is doing. A lot of things it just isn't interested in. We have a lot of thoughts, feelings, and ideas that ramble around in our head that our spirit has no interest in. It doesn't want those. It's looking for the wisdom from our experiences which are correct according to creation. It's trying to add to itself through growth, through your experience, through your material, personal experiences. So there's a filter in between. I call it a filter, but it's just kind of a little something in there that it's kind of like a microphone, I guess. It's listening to your material self, and it receives information, and it decides whether or not it's correct and uh, whether or not it's interesting to accept it. Over on your spiritual side, there's also a spiritual conscious mind. It's like a receiver and sender unit. There's also a subconscious on the spiritual side. It also can think, do some number crunching and so forth. There's a little we form there, which I'll explain in a minute. And then there's something called the Gemut. G-E-M-U-T, Gemut. It's a word in German, which means receiver and sender or sense sensor. It's slightly different than the psyche, its counterpart on the material side, in that the psyche only stores information and all your memories from your material life. Okay? But the gay mood, on the other hand, is more of a sensing device, because it's connected to other forms of information, higher levels of thinking. This is where your spiritual power comes in. The ability to use the gay mood as a sensing device to actually move out and get information from different sources. And there's a language concerned with that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Well, these are the basic parts of the material side and of the spiritual side. So let's talk about those just a little bit. Let me explain a little bit about what each one does and <clears throat> excuse me, what happens as you're going through your day-to-day -day thinking. Okay, over on the material side, you notice up on the top there, it has the five senses there. that We've got sight and touch and smell and hearing and so forth, your senses there. And you know what these are. This is how we gather information. Now here's what happens. Your material self, as we've mentioned before, the reason for your material life is to gather information. Once you gather that information, uh, then you proceed to think about it, you form logic, and you do a little number crunching, whatever, you make conclusions, and you store that information. And once that information becomes part of yourself, it becomes the wisdom from those experiences, and that's added to your spiritual growth. Here's how it works. Let's say you're having an experience, and let's um, make up some sort of experience here. Let's say something common in life, uh, maybe a career move. you got a new job. Okay? You've been working at a company for a while, and, you know, a big promotion's coming up, and uh, uh, there's you and two or three other people that are online for the promotion. Now, let's make this a happy story. So let's say you get the promotion, all right? Well, as we're going through life all the time, we're using all of our senses all the time to gather data, aren't we? You know, right now you're using your ears to listen to what I'm saying, and you use your eyes to read information, and we have touch. Uh, we touch things to see what it's about. We smell it. We taste it. These are how we, all of our sensors are out there, material sensors, are always gathering information and feeding it to us. Well, as soon as that information comes in from our sensors, as soon as we see something, uh, our conscious mind regulates all of these sensors. As it receives that information, it very, very quickly uh, runs right down to see if we have any information on that. You see, the conscious mind actually can't make any decisions on its own. It has an entirely different function. It's responsible for gathering the information and bringing it in and so forth. But on its own, it can't make any decisions really on its own. So it doesn't. Actually, what it does is that when that information comes in from you, uh, it quickly directs that thought or idea directly to your subconscious to see if we have any data on that. Because in your subconscious is all of your knowledge. And it wants to know if this new incoming thought, uh, if it's, we're sympathetic to it or uh, if we have any feelings about this. What's our opinions? Do we have any knowledge? Is there any data on this thing that just came in? And it's done very, very quickly. So what happens is, as you're listening to this tape, reading a book, or 
you know, you just heard some information about this promotion that you're going to get it. You become very excited, but maybe uh, somebody says something, well, gee, the person who gets the promotion is going to be the one who had the highest sales. And you're quickly thinking, oh, sales. Your mind flashes off into, like, you know, running back over all of your sales numbers to see if you're, you know, think you might be eligible. Well, as soon as you heard that information about the sales, your ears picked it up and went through your conscious mind. Your conscious mind turns around immediately. And in an instant, in a flash, it runs to your subconscious to get any data to see what we think about that, and then comes back and gives a feeling or an impression about any data we have on that, and then you react. You react like, oh, good, I'm okay, or, gee, that's bad, or, gee, I better look that over, or, you know, you, you weighing one word against the other, whatever you have to do. It gets that information from the subconscious. So because the conscious mind on its own really doesn't do anything at all. The, the subconscious is kind of like the computer the, of the individual. It's the actual center and the, the control guidance center, you might call it, and that's responsible for the individual's entire internal communication, as well as its connection with the spiritual realm, because it's through the subconscious uh, that the individual tries to get information into the spiritual subconscious all the time. Well, it's also responsible for person-to-person -person contact. You know, if you want to uh, you know, get in touch with someone else telepathically through feelings and guidance and so forth. And that's where that little thing called the we form comes in. But now when our person here is up for a promotion, he's using his senses and so forth to gather information. And it comes in, it goes down to the subconscious uh, to see if we have any data, if we have any known facts on that. And then it flies, flash like right back up to the conscious mind, so the conscious mind can actually react. That's how the system actually works. The psyche, on the other hand, which is down at the bottom down there, that the, the psyche itself, it just does feelings and thinkings. It's, um, uh, it's kind of like that's the area, actually, it's the factors of thinking, feeling, it processes an individual's, your, in, uh, your disposition, your morality. And that's the type of things that are down there. So, you know, we want to be careful what we feed that. Well, what happens is every time you are making decisions, and let's say now this guy gets the promotion, and it leads him into new information, but what's he done now? He's experienced a promotion in life, and because of that, he learned new things about himself. He met new people, and his life changed a little bit now because of these new leadership qualities that were put upon him. He had new things that he, um, new problems he had to work with. He was exposed to new challenges in life by virtue of this promotion. So he had some new things in life to conquer, to learn, and to do, and it changed him. Have you ever seen someone, maybe when they get a promotion, their attitude changes a little bit? Leadership sets well with them. It brings out a different part of that individual, and they change a little bit. It becomes part of that person. Well, when something becomes part of you, when you've had an experience that becomes part of yourself and changes the way you are, then you've gained some wisdom. It's those are the kind of experiences that your spirit is interested in, because that's the kind of information that your spirit collects. So what would happen is these experiences, these new ideas and wisdom and so forth that you get, this wisdom from all of that, will go through that filter, that sensing device there in the middle, and that will go over and be stored over in your spiritual subconscious then and become part of your continuing knowledge. That sensor in the middle also is kind of a buffer between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Because the subconscious mind does not like to be bothered all the time with, uh, you know, with the type of information that's irrelevant or flivorous. If you have some fleeting thought or whatever which really doesn't have anything to do or you're not serious about, the subconscious doesn't want to bother. The sensor will bounce it back, and the subconscious really isn't bothered at all. So that's the process. Then we have this little thing called the we form there in the middle. The we form actually <clears throat> is what many of us think of as telepathy. What the we form is, it's a sensor. It's a sensing device, uh, much like your other senses, but it works a little bit differently. You see, the subconscious mind has the ability to move thoughts and feelings among all of us, among people. And it does it with kind of an image language, a symbol language. Now, the we form on the material side is called primary telepathy. The Pleiadians use the phrase we form because there's all these we people are all formed into one consciousness. For instance, 
let's say our fellow that's, uh, <clears throat> well, forget the fellow, let's just say yourself. If you've ever been in a really crowded area, maybe you get into an elevator and there's, uh, you get in and you turn around and you're all alone and there's some very unsavory, large, slurry, dirty character in the elevator that's looking at you like, you know, there could be potential harm here. You're very uncomfortable, okay? Well, you're not only all of your senses are reading his look and feel and everything, but he's probably projecting some very unkind thoughts about you, and that's done from subconscious to subconscious, and it's your we form that's picking that up. Have you ever walked over to the phone and known it was somebody calling or had a hunch <clears throat> who was going to knock at the door or, you know, you had a hunch to uh, go pick up your laundry or something or just some feeling? That's what comes out of the we form. The primary telepathy is confined pretty much to the planet at short range. Uh, by that, I mean you can pick up thoughts and feelings from people around the planet. This is also how, like in large metropolitan areas, that the subconscious of millions of people who may be unhappy, angry, or unrestful and so forth affects other people. We talked earlier about uh, how you really couldn't have spiritual growth in a major city. This is one of the reasons why. Because your subconscious mind, without you being conscious of it all the time, is constantly picking up these feelings, images, and so forth from the we form, the telepathic we form, in your subconscious on your material side. Now you notice over on the right side, it says we form also, and it calls that spiritual telepathy. That's a little different. Over on the <clears throat> material side, the primary telepathy is rather basic. It's a, it's a form of hearing. It's a tone that comes in the ear that you can learn to uh, receive it. That can be blocked. You can learn actually to block out those feelings and so forth so they don't really bother you. On the other hand, over on the other side, the spiritual telepathy, unlike the primary telepathy, is very long range. And this is how Billy was able to receive telepathic transmissions and so forth from the Pleiadians and other higher life forms over on the spiritual side. This is also what channeling is supposed to be. When you receive information from other beings and higher sources, it's done through the subconscious we form on the spiritual side in the form of telepathy. And this is a language of symbols. There are 50, over 50 million symbols, sometimes called keys, that interpret spiritual knowledge. And if you wish to be in touch with higher life forms and so forth, this is how it's done. You develop the use of your spirit, and you receive telepathic images in this language that come into your spiritual self. They then are translated into your speaking language and sent to the material side. So never is there a trance needed. Any person who is actually channeling, it's impossible to channel a being from another world because channeling is only short range and channeling concerns itself with actually with the psyche, which is your center for feelings and thinking and so forth. Also, this interplays uh, if a person has an ego problem, wants to be popular, wants to be noted, wants to be thought of well and so forth. These thoughts interfere in the individual when they're channeling, and that's why they create the persona. It's done by their uh, insides, their psyche, and their subconscious, more or less, get together and create this euphoric meditation. That's why they always speak and make up some strange sound. This is Uthor from Egypt or whatever. You know, well, it's, it's not. It's, it's an individual creating that by themselves. Channeling is not real. It is never accurate. If you wish to receive information from a higher life form or another individual on another world, it is done through the spiritual self, it is done through the spiritual we form, and it involves the knowledge of the symbol language actually receiving it. So that's how it would actually work. You do not have to be unconscious. Uh, you do not, there is never needed the trance, and there is never needed uh, a separate persona in order to receive this information. You can learn to do it in a fully conscious, awake state. The gay moot's a fascinating little device. Uh, the gay mood over there is a sensor. You've heard people talk sometimes about how uh, the silver cord where you're connected to uh, creation. Well, that's kind of what the gay moot is. It is a sensing device that can connect you to higher forms of information also. If you are interested in contacting your higher self or someone else's higher self, you can use the spiritual we form to do this. <clears throat> it, of course, takes a lot of practice. Some people it comes easier than others, and it's done through an understanding of this symbol or key language, and you develop it through meditation. 
Meditation is no mystical magic or anything. It's the simple process of just learning to control yourself, control your mind, to control your material self and your spiritual self, and turn one off and on as you like. You see, meditation, what you do is you shut down your material senses over there that are all very active. You shut down your conscious mind, and you get into a state of meditation, which is a balanced state where you, the individual of them, have access to your spiritual self. And then what you do, once you gain knowledge of your spiritual force, you have to actually get in touch with your spiritual self, that power will develop. You can then ask for and receive the symbols and keys of your own name, of your own self. You can then start looking and finding symbols and learn more symbols so you can access other higher forms of information. Now, aside from some ET on another planet that you may want to uh, talk to, if they're willing to respond, uh, one of the more interesting things to access is something called the Akashic Records. Now, what are the Akashic Records? In metaphysical terms, they're sometimes called the etheric records or whatever, but here's the general idea. As you are thinking, and as everyone is thinking, thoughts, remember, now are forms of energy. Energy condensed and condensed and so forth to higher, higher levels of co uh, compactness or conden condensation, I guess you would say, uh, can be formed into matter. But at any rate, thoughts don't die out. Once you form a thought, it is a very, very small impulse of energy that you have created by virtue of your own brain, and they are stored. Well, where are they stored? Well, your thoughts are stored you know, in your sub subconscious. They're also your, uh, stored also in this Akashic Records. So an Akashic Record is a band of energy around a planet that stores all the thoughts of the people on the planet. There's also a storehouse of knowledge or an Akashic Record around a galaxy, and there's also an Akashic Record for a universe. All these forms of Akashic Records store different types of information. Now, you have access to these Akashic Records all of the time, and you access them through the we form on the spiritual side. The knowledge of the past, though, is protected. You can't just jump into it. It's not like open to everyone. You have to learn how to use the we form and how to make this connection. Psychics tap into the we form uh, uh, quite often by accident and uh, are not even aware of what they're actually doing. Uh, for instance, I know there are... Um, uh, if any of you have seen Luis Gasparetto do his spirit paintings, that's what he's doing. He's accessing the Akashic Records. Here's what happens. Let's say you want to um, get in touch with Da Vinci. Well, Da Vinci, the personality that was Da Vinci, is dead and gone. He has reincarnated out as somebody else, and there's been maybe one or two lifetimes since then. So Da Vinci himself is gone. Da Vinci is no longer on the other side. He's not in the fine matter world. If he was, he wouldn't respond anyway, because in the fine matter world, he's not Da Vinci. He's a collection of all of his lifetimes at that point. But if we want to access, say, Da Vinci and do something, we can get access to Da Vinci's thoughts in the Akashic Records while he was Da Vinci. And that can be done uh, by through the we form. We would first would have to find out how to access uh, his particular records, because the Akashic Records is made up in levels. Uh, there are levels of evolution, and each level of evolution has like a memory level in it, and you need a key to get into that. So you learn through meditation, you send a pulse to certain levels that get you into it. One interesting thing is you can't get into a level of information in the Akashic Records that's higher than your own evolution. So if we're going to try to get access to Da Vinci's uh, thoughts and feelings that are in the Akashic Records, we couldn't get access to any of those thoughts and feelings at a time when his level of evolution was higher than our own. So if Da Vinci was much higher evolved than us, we wouldn't get very much. We would get something, though. But what happens is when you get in touch with those feelings, let's say we learn the symbols and we find out how to send the pulse, we can actually get in there, and just for those moments while we're in touch and in connection with the Akashic Record, we will think and feel like Da Vinci. And our body can react. It can react in the form of auto-writing. That's how it's commonly done. It cannot react vocally. It's not possible to get into the Akashic Records and speak like Da Vinci. You can't channel the Akashic Records, in other words. 
You know, Da Vinci's not going to come into your body, take over your body, and speak. That's not possible. But it is possible for you to access the Akashic Record and think and feel like him for a moment, and you could write or draw and do things. Billy demonstrates this by quite easily, within very simply, he can get into the Akashic Record because he knows most of the keys. He has access to many different forms of information which were taught to him. And he can suddenly think and feel like Enoch or some particular one that he happens to know the key for. So that is a possibility. That's one way you can get in touch with other forms of information through the Akashic Records. One other thing I'd like to touch on just a little bit while we're discussing this material and the spiritual self. Um, and by the way, just uh, kind of uh, give you some insight into this. You know, there we also have emotions and attitudes and so forth that we build. When we come into the world, the material side is very clean. It's like a clean slate. The, our psyche has no feelings and thoughts in it. Our subconscious is like a blank hard drive in a computer. It doesn't have any stored up memories at that point. We're a newborn person in the world, and we just kind of got here. And what, all we have with us when we come in is that accumulated knowledge from the previous lifetimes. So we're all happy. We're just dad, dad, goo, goo, happy to be here. We smile and we love everything. Don't we wish we could keep that all of our life? But it doesn't stay that way. You know, our, all of a sudden, all sorts of things are dumped on top of us. And while we're laying in the crib, uh, you know, our senses are starting to work. And we start perceiving knowledge of the outside world. And about the age of two, we start becoming aware of the outside world. And I think that's why babies cry almost their entire second year. They're probably sad to be here in some areas. You know, they're, they're, they're moving into the material world and they don't like the way things are going on. It's probably a little uncomfortable for them. But what happens? Our senses start picking up the experiences of life and we start developing our little attitudes and emotions about how we react to things. Let's say we have an individual who's 30 years old, who's divorced, become an alcoholic, and lost his job. If we have someone like that, what has happened? He's lived through some terrible experiences. He makes associations with his experiences. He develops all of these emotions and attitudes towards certain things. Then every bit of information that comes in when he perceives something, let's say about his divorce, maybe uh, his wife always wore uh, red shoes, and he sees a woman walking down the street with his eyes, so the sensor, the eyes pick up the red shoes, what's he going to do right away? He immediately associates that with the bad memory of the recent divorce, doesn't he? So he doesn't actually perceive this person as they really are. He doesn't see them subjectively at all. Uh, what he does is, instead, when he sees this person, he just sees red shoes, a trigger goes off inside, and uh, you know he doesn't react normally towards this individual if he's going to react at all. So we can be greatly controlled by all of our you know, programming we go through life with. So one of the main functions uh, that we need to do is to learn to meditate, to close down some of our emotions and attitudes, all these knee-jerk responses that we develop and so forth as we go along, so we can control ourselves. So we can learn to reprogram ourselves and see people objectively when they walk down the street. I mean, not subjectively, objectively. When they're walking down the street in red shoes. So we can just say, oh, there's a pair of red shoes and there's a new person that I don't know. And don't make any attachment to all of the difficult feelings and problems that you may have had during a divorce. But we do that. Our material side, as we go on and on in life, becomes difficult, become very difficult for us to think clearly and stay in balance. And this is what leads many people, unfortunately, to becoming hostile or violent in life or depressed or angry or jealous. Life's experiences build up. They have so many uh, problems in life that are so difficult. They develop all these emotions and attitudes where they can't see things clearly. So their subconscious never even gets a chance to react. And then if they're too far gone, which leads to violence or jealousy or whatever, uh, that the spirit itself will just literally shut down. It will no longer even be interested in any of the information that the material self is gathering. The life from that point on is just considered a spiritual waste. That the spirit itself will no longer be interested in anything that the material side comes up with. No more wisdom could be added because it's all illogical. Meditation allows us the possibility of reprogramming and changing things. It is the process where we can shut down the material senses 
and very slowly an individual that may have all these problems can learn to overcome them and reprogram themselves through benefit of their spiritual self. They can literally ask their spirit for advice and help sort out problems, which the spirit will do. Your spiritual subconscious will go in there and think things through for you and give you back feelings and ideas and hunches that are you know, good for you. Your material self then, especially if someone's guiding you, your material self then can begin to learn from these experiences and start seeing itself clearer and get itself back in balance. So we have a process here by which we could reclaim mental health, uh, we could uh, overcome personality problems, depression, things like that. We could, through meditation, incorporate this in and make kind of a new psychology of the future through spiritual development. Through use of the spirit, which never gets sick and never dies, we can learn to control and change ourselves somewhat. Again, you see that the spirit's always open for business. It listens to everything unless you go berserk in life and it has to shut down because <laughs> you're way off track. But it's open all the time. It records all your thoughts, all your movements and so forth. It's paying attention to everything. And it sends answers to the human being if his thoughts are right or wrong. You just have to learn to pay attention to it. You learn through meditation to create what's called the pause. That slight split second when information comes in and before you react with your material self, you consult your spiritual self to see about that. Ask yourselves, like asking a good friend that will always tell you the right answer. You can learn to pause and kind of like mentally uh, quickly get an opinion from your spiritual self and it will answer you truthfully. The spirit is the carrier of the creation. It's found in everyone. On our spiritual self is that part piece of creation. And remember, creation is the perfection. It has the ultimate peace, the ultimate universal love. So what a great place to consult with. And if you have this great spiritual self within you that has the ability to touch and feel that and consult with it and draw information from it, why not use it? Many of the old philosophers always made reference to the individual as being, you know, uh, every man contains a microcosm within a microcosm, and that's true. Because everything in the universe that exists, everything within creation, also exists in the human being. There are different dimensions in the inner being that are endless. So it's beginning to look like the matrix of the creation, the logic of the creation, comes comes into the spirit, the spirit facilitates creating the body, so information from the spirit is in every cell, every atom particle of the body itself, and these get smaller and smaller all the time, so there's kind of like microcosm within microcosm. There's a copy of your creation, uh, it, uh, your spirit has a copy of creation, it's in everybody, and it contains all dimensions. You see, when an individual can start looking at life with a balanced view from his material side and his spiritual side. When he learns to start using the spirit all the time as a source of, of energy, of knowledge, of wisdom, then he starts becoming a much happier individual. That way he doesn't, he's not prone to knee-jerk responses and emotions that get him entirely out of whack. And he's not going to overreact to things and overrespond. He'll be able to calmly see things. He'll be able to always refer to his spiritual self for knowledge. The nice part, too, is that he'll just be a lot happier. An individual who lives, you know, by the creational logic, who uses his spiritual self and is always, always seeking to get closer to creation, will find that he is somehow just luckier, and he has kind of spiritual poise. See, luck belongs to the inner being. It's an inseparable mark of the existence of the spirit within you. When you are close to that spiritual self, um, it just naturally happens. There's a force that rises up in you. The material body may continue to age. It gets older and the material body changes. But the spirit itself doesn't age like that. Even though you may be 50, 70, 80 years old materially, excuse me, where the body is starting to deteriorate, the spiritual self has not aged. It still remains young and healthy and vibrant inside in there. So you can even use your spiritual self to facilitate looking better and living longer. At least while you're alive, your material self will be happier, more fulfilled, and you'll have a healthier life. 
Once an individual recognizes his spirit, he becomes to become more powerful, and doubts and things like that in depression just vanish away. If you even try it yourself after listening to this tape and start making some efforts in meditation, we have a tape on meditation in this uh, kit also, if you listen to that and start practicing that, you'll find just with a few simple exercises and practicing, you'll find you'll get in touch with your spirit, you'll be able to like uh, use it a little bit and find that there's an exhilarating feeling in calling upon your spirit and doing something for the right reasons and finding that it's actually in there and making that connection with creation. It's exhilarating. The world will look different. Instantly you feel better about life. Any fears about death just vanish right away. And there's this wisdom that comes into you that there's a calmness with it, a peace with it, that makes you feel really good. And it's kind of like an inner light that comes with you. See, wisdom and spirit, they're two factors, but they really result in just basically the same thing, because your spirit contains all of that wisdom. A person who knows and can feel the creation once that happens develops an inner peace and assurance. He can defend himself against any kind of silly thoughts or strange feelings in because of the power that grows within you. The way you do it is you deliberate on the truth. Wisdom and knowledge of creation, it affects your feelings and changes an individual's thinking. The more his intelligence, the more you direct your intelligence to the quest of knowledge about the creation, the more forceful becomes your personality and the easier your life actually becomes. First, all it's necessary to do is learn the kind of the spirit intellectual mode of thinking, and then you recognize how right it actually is, how it actually works, how you can actually get in touch with the creation itself through your spirit. When you have your first successes through meditation, then you move forward by very large leaps and bounds because you know you're onto something. You get excited, and there's this enlargement of the spiritual self. There's this like inner power. You start feeling much luckier. Things just get easier. It just happens for someone. And you begin to understand that it's good to be 100% responsible for yourself. You develop this feeling of confidence and assuredness that only comes from the knowledge of your own personal power, your own spirit. Your development then is free from fear and anxiety. Those things no longer bother you at all. So you would no longer have any doubts or uh, fears about death. They just vanish, and you can keep constantly in touch with this feeling about universal love and the great feelings that you can get by constantly knowing that creation is there. It's a great strength. Okay, I can see we're uh, running out of tape again, so it's time to stop this part. We have two more important tapes, uh, Meditation and Psyche which lead in more into the mechanics of things, so uh, I'll meet you over there.